Voice Hope Radio for the masses. Headline of this is July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, welcome, Fade to Black. How you doing? Today is Thursday, March 21st. 2024. Let's do this. Today, Rizverk is here, and we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of The Matrix. That's right. That's what we are going to do tonight. And I know that the uh, chat is going to be lively. Uh, the, the film has had a huge, deep uh, cultural impact worldwide, not only on myself, but on everyone. And it's one of the most quoted films uh, in history. It's one of the most successful films, too, as well, and is regarded as now one of the uh, greatest films ever made. And, and now, when I talk about quotes, and Riz and I were uh, chatting about this right before the show, you know, you've got a movie, and there's a line in the movie that gets quoted, and, you know, like Jaws, you know, we've got to get a bigger boat. And, and and think you know, but but the Matrix is full of that for each character, and these things that have worked themselves into our lives, our culture, and and attitudes, and ideas, and and things. And I don't know of another film that has had this kind of impact. So I'm going to keep my eye on the chat tonight. If you've got a favorite quote from the movie, pop it up in the chat. I'll, uh, you know, if uh, they're all good, uh, but I'll read it on the air. I've I've got some quotes here too as well, and facts and and things, and of course my own opinions and insight on the film. And before I bring Riz in, I want to say this um, so I don't take away time for the show here in Los Angeles. We used to have, I don't know if it's still around, but we used to have uh, this magazine paper. It was called the LA Weekly, and it was free, and you could just go and pick it up. It was thick, and it uh, was everything Los Angeles, and certainly entertainment-focused. There was a lot of uh, uh, articles and, and really excellent journalism in there, but also movie reviews, full schedules on every theater in Los Angeles and showtimes and upcoming films and premieres and releases and film reviews uh, and music and everything else. But anyway, that was, you know, my thing. And I would uh, get my copy every week. And 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 I was, uh, at the time, I was living alone in, in Sherman Oaks. And... And, you know, so I open it up and, and I'm running through and I see The Matrix and, you know, premiere. And so I go and I read what it's about. Didn't really get it. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, uh, I would love to go and find that original uh, L.A. Weekly announcement about the movie. But um, th- th- that was wrong. Right. But it but. But it enticed me enough. I was like, okay, all right, what, when is this? You know, and then I look and it's like premiering that night or the next night uh, in Sherman Oaks. And that's how I found the movie. There wasn't any hype about it. There wasn't, and, and I live here in Hollywood. There's just, it, it caught me by surprise. So, but I was intrigued. And I went, and that's how I found the movie. I found it from the L.A. Weekly. And now, I I mentioned this uh, earlier this week on the air, but tonight we're doing the show, so I'll say it again. Um, That first night, I totally enjoyed it. I didn't get it, 
But the action, the cinematography, the way it was laid out, the camera angles, the special effects, uh, the storyline, I was kind of following it. But I left the theater, and I was with a friend, and I remember us stopping outside like, wow, uh, what was that all about? You know, that kind of conversation. Did you get it? I don't know. Did you? Uh, so I ended up the next night, I went back and to the same theater. Uh, it was a block from my house. And I paid and walked in and watched it again. Now, my memory is a little fuzzy at this point. I started to understand. Okay, I started to get the film. I think I may have gone back a third time, like three nights in a row. I know for uh, a definite fact, I went back a week later, um, and it was still running, and I, I saw it quite a few times in the theater, and I started to get it. I went back, and I was reading reviews, and and I think that a lot of the early reviews, everybody loved its its visuals. I don't think anybody really, really got the message message it, that that developed over the coming months, um, and it uh, it ended up uh, in a in, in in a very short time. I'm going to say probably three months. Uh, it was about that where my friends were starting to talk about it and these these deeper philosophical issues and and what the matrix meant and what it was and 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 unplugging and and so forth and that's now looking back right from where we are today it's very easy to understand the matrix and uh, easier to discuss it but how many times do people reference it Right, daily life and and everything else. Wait, oh man, uh, we're in the matrix. I need to unplug. Uh, I've been red pilled. Right, all of these things are a part of our lives because of the matrix. So Riz Verk is here. Riz wanted to do the show. He came at me uh, a couple of months ago, circled the date on the calendar, and said. Okay, it's the 25th anniversary of the Matrix, and we're going to do a show. And I said, okay, all right, I'm down for that. I'm down. So tonight, Riz is back with us. Um, he's a business guy. He's an investor. He's a futurist. Of course, he's a best selling author, uh, he's a video game industry pioneer, and he's also an indie filmmaker. He received his BS in computer science from MIT and MS in management from Stanford's GSB and is currently working on his PhD. And with all of that, everybody knows Riz. I'm just going to bring him straight in and go, dude, it's going to be a great show. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, Jimmy. This is a, a fun topic to talk about. <laughs> yeah, this is this is your idea. This is your idea. Hey, um, I wanted to say this, Riz, before we get started. Um, uh, hanging out with you at the Conscious Life Expo uh, this this year was was great fun. But the other part is watching people respond to you and and filling a room like that uh, really meant a lot for me, and it was a very special moment. And people are paying attention to you, man. And that was uh, really cool for me. And it was, uh, it was a very special moment. So thank you for that. That was really cool. Absolutely. And thanks for, uh, you know, introducing me there at, at the Conscious Life Expo. Uh, you know, that, that was great. And I hadn't been there since I think 2018 was the last time I was there, which was when I first met you in person. Wait, I think uh, it was, was, it, yeah. was, it, was it a good introduction? Uh, the first time, uh, yeah, no, I think so. uh, this time, this uh, time, oh, oh yeah, it, it, yeah, 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 it was, it was good, it was good, absolutely. So, thank you uh, for it, doing that. You see me do it enough when I introduce, I don't read, I when people introduce and they read their bio, you know, and, and I don't, I don't do that, right? I just get up, I, I know who you are, right? <laughs> I know right. who I am, yep. and and it's just, you know, and then. 
then I walk off the stage. So just as long as it and was we, good, it was and good. Then we had, uh, you know, Daniel Brinkley also showed up, which was great because he was the one I think who introduced us. Originally. Oh, that's right. That's right. Oh, you know. he, he, he crashed the party. He did. He that's did. right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I remember now. I remember. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So let's um, let's get started. I have uh, uh, a couple of things I want to mention really quick, um, just like some uh, fun facts, but I want to get some things out of the way uh, about the Matrix. Uh, the release date was March 24th, 1999, here in Los Angeles at the Man, Val- uh, Man Village Theater which is over by UCLA and a lot of film premieres happen there. And that's where the matrix premiered. Then on March 31st, 1999, it did its uh, release in the United States. And then it was released April 8th, 1999 in Australia. And its original budget was just $63 million. I mean, that was all the money back then for sure. But, uh, it's box office. Now I'm not talking about DVDs or any th- other revenue or anything else, but it's box office in the United States uh, rounded out at $467.2 million on a $63 million investment. That's not a bad return, is it? That's not bad at all. But do you know it was not the highest grossing movie of that year of 19? No, it, it wasn't. And, and it, it wasn't even the, the one that people were talking about before it came out. But by the end of the year, it was the most talked about movie of the year. Yeah, it was like uh, Toy Story 2 or something. Star Wars, <laughs> the, the Phantom Menace was actually the yeah, highest. Yeah, right, 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 that right, year. right. And so everyone thought, oh, we're going to get another Star Wars movie. This is going to be the best movie of the year. And in the same way that I think people didn't expect Star Wars in 1977 to become this phenomenon where people would just go and watch it again. I remember, you know, my my brother and I back in 1977 would go and just watch it again and again. And the same thing happened with The Matrix and people just didn't expect that. So it really was, you know, I think a a surprise to a lot of people. (laughs) Yeah, it uh, and a couple of other things uh, that I'm going to start off with. Um, yes, it won four Academy Awards. It won for Best Film Editing, Best Sound, Best Sound Effects Editing, and Best Visual Effects. And, of course, uh, it introduced a lot of different things, but one of them uh, was Bullet Time. And the special effect that was a a real effect done with cameras. And today, bullet time or anything like that, that's uh, computers and software and and, and so forth. But back then, I think that's one of the things that uh, is captured in the film. Uh, uh, There is some computer stuff there for sure. but, But the real stuff, that's cable kung fu and bullet time and slowing time down uh, was done uh, with 360 degree high speed cameras and i think that that is one of the reasons why it's it's lasted as long as it has because we're not looking at something that's computer generated it was actually uh, captured with cameras uh, pretty amazing effects for for its time yeah, absolutely. I, I think I was surprised that it didn't win the best costume that year when you mentioned those Academy Awards. So I had to look it up. Uh, and turns out it was Shakespeare in Love, I think, won the best costumes that year, <laughs> which, which is funny. Moss, yeah, Carrie Ann Moss should have won. They they should have had an Academy Award for best sunglasses, right? <laughs> well, you know, the special effects, they really have stood the test of time, right? I mean, I watched it again recently this week, or at least the first half again. I've seen the movie so many times that it, it was one of those where you say, you know, the effects do hold up. I mean, yeah, it looks like a 90s film, but even today, if you were to make a period film about the 90s, right, the special effects wouldn't be that much better. I think, you know, because they did such a good job with it. Yeah. Now I'm going to uh, start off with this and then we'll we'll jump into the film itself. But um, here's the original movie poster. And there's a reason why I'm showing this. First off, it's cool, right? That's that's the first thing. Um, And uh, there's Cypher, Morpheus, and Neo, and Trinity, right? Okay, now I'm going to come to the bottom of... 
on March 31st, the fight for the future begins, right? Okay, now let's zoom in here. Written and directed by the Wachowski brothers. Okay. Um, that's not the case today, is it? The Wachowski brothers. And so I wanted to show that's the original movie poster. Uh, the Wachowski brothers are now the Wachowski sisters. And I, when I had first heard about this, they, they have both transitioned, right? Uh, Larry Wachowski is now Lana Wachowski. And Andy Wachowski is now Lily Wachowski. They have both transitioned. And so I, I just want it's it's needs to be mentioned for a couple of things. First off, I didn't know any. The first time I had heard something about, and it was the director's name or something, Lily or Lana. And I was like, oh. The Wachowski brothers have a Wachowski sister that's directing? What? That's a family thing. That's I didn't know. I nobody knew. And then and I and then what? What? And I read and I thought, no. So I had jumped onto the internet to find and there was nothing about this. So I was very, very confused. And that was in uh, the, the mid 2000s or so. And uh, it was probably around 2016, I'm guessing here. Uh, we're in 2024. 2016, 2017, I had read a, uh, uh, the Wachowski sisters have uh, directed a new movie, and they also did The Matrix. And I went, the sisters? What, what and, and and I go and again I couldn't find anything on the internet about this. There was little things here and there, but they kept it private. And uh, and now the statements um, that that are there from them, um, yes, they are they are women today. That's fine, but uh, they they did all of this with without anybody knowing. And and they wanted to keep that that private and a mad respect for that, but I did not know, and it was really strange how Hollywood and and the writers and and everybody out there either knew about it and respected their privacy, or they just kept it that private and nobody knew, and therefore there was no soap opera around it. Um, and did, did when I go back and I show you the Wachowski brothers here, do, do you feel that there might have been some other philosophical messages or undertones in the movie about this? I never got that uh, from it. Uh, did you pick up on that? Well, I would say no, not when I first saw it. I didn't really pick up on it, or even the first few times that I saw it. Uh, like you, I think it was 2015 when the movie Jupiter Ascending came out. Mm -hmm. That was basically, it said the directors were the Wachowski sisters. And that's when it occurred to me. I was like, wait, <laughs> isn't that the same people who made The Matrix? And so that's that's when I found out about it. That said, you know, when I, uh, when I released my book, The Simulation Hypothesis, which was on the 20th anniversary, back in uh, 2019 on March 31st, uh, I was on an NPR show and that was one of the themes that they were talking about was, is this a trans allegory of, of some kind? And, and I right. have to say, you know, I had thought a lot about the video game and the simulation. Uh, and I had thought a lot about how in a video game, you can take on any identity you want, right? Uh, you don't have to be, you know, the same person in terms of how you look, uh, how you present yourself. You know, you, you could have a male avatar, you could have a female avatar, you could dress a certain way, you could have a robot avatar, right? You could have any kind of avatar. And so, you know, I had gotten into those kinds of issues around video games, but but I have to admit that it, I, I didn't, you know, pick up on that until much later, till, till I started participating in discussions about the Matrix. And that came up, you know. Well, okay, so you're told about it, but yep. when you go back and watch it now, is do you pick up on anything? I I still don't. I now I I know, but I don't I don't get that from the movie at all. It's it's really strange. 
Yeah, I don't, I mean, when I watch the movie, I'm so focused on kind of these, the dream, the themes that this is like a dream, uh, this computer simulation and the AI angles that I tend not to pick up on that myself either. But, you know, there are elements of both in terms of the clothing, but also this idea of uh, hiding who you truly are and coming out of this egg into the real world. Like th there's an element of that that ties into, you know, a lot of those discussions. But but I'm kind of like you, Jimmy. I tend to look at the action and the philosophy around, you know, existence uh, and, you know, what would it mean for the world if something, uh, if we were in fact inside a computer simulation like this uh, and all of the philosophical issues that, that come into around that. But, you know, there's this, there's this uh, line. I know we're going to get into lines later, but uh, where, you know, uh, Neo has come out of, you know, the pod and he goes back in uh, to the construct, right, with, with Morpheus. And he goes, wait, you mean this isn't real? And Morpheus says, you know, well, look, you don't have any, you know, you don't have any holes in your head. <laughs> you don't have any, you have hair. Uh, so clearly this is not the physical world. But he said, what you have is a, is a digital a residual self-image, right? So it's this image of yourself that gets projected into there. And then they picked up on that theme in the latest movie, uh, which is the, the Matrix Resurrections, this idea that Neo looked like somebody else, right, for the first part of that. Well, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the, the Matrix Resurrections, although that was 2021, 20, so that was a few years ago now at this point as well. Uh, so, I mean, I see it in that in that angle, but, but like you, I, I, I tend to focus, I think, more on some of the other issues. Now, uh, some basic questions, simple ones. Do you have a favorite character? My favorite character in the Matrix is definitely Morpheus, right? Okay. Uh, you know, yep, that, that would be my my favorite. Second favorite is probably Agent Smith. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right, yeah. There you go. There you go. Um, it, 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 it's a tough call for me because uh, the entire crew on the Nebuchadnezzar, uh, everybody played their roles so well. Um, but as a whole, I went through this thing, uh, when the matrix came out on DVD. So I go and I get, you know, the special director's cut and there was a second DVD of the making of the matrix. Right. And, uh, boy, those were the days, wasn't it? And DVD player yeah. anyway. So I sat, I, I watched that movie. I mean, and I'm not in, in any way exaggerating. I watched it every night for a couple of months. I could not stop watching the film. And and I got to the point where the first uh, interrogation, right, with Neo and Agent Smith in the room when Neo's mouth gets sealed shut, right, that whole scene, I sat on my laptop. And I transcribed it, the whole thing, word for word, stopping it, going back, catching it, getting all the pods. And then, and then I memorized it. I was that into it. And Agent Smith, man, Hugo Weaving, he owned it. He owned it. He absolutely owned it. He, he really did. Now, um, one other uh, question, then uh, uh, we'll, we'll move on. I mentioned this to you earlier. Was this everybody in the cast? Was this their finest moment? Yeah, that's right. You did mention this to me, but I think I think in many ways it was, right? So if you look at from the directors, not just the cast, right? But even in terms of the directors, it was kind of the high, the high moment of their career. Uh, even though they made the two Matrix sequels, it was really the def the defining moment, I should say, maybe more so than the than the highest moment. Um, but uh, in terms of you know everyone else, like uh, Lawrence Fishburne and Morpheus, uh, who you know I'll have a story about later, uh, but you know that's the role that he'll he'll be remembered by, right? And I think that's true of you know Carrie Ann Moss. Uh, even Keanu Reeves, right? I mean, he's he's had plenty of roles. Obviously, he's got. He'll the always role. he will yeah. always be Neo. I mean, he's not Bill and Ted. I can tell you that, right? And <laughs> you know, he will always be Neo. And um, same thing with uh, Joe uh, uh, Pantoliano. Um, 
you know, you think about uh, and, and Carrie Ann Moss, you know, as great as she is, will never, right? Is it everybody's just finest moment, which says a lot to the screenplay, says a lot to the movie, um, and, of course, the directors and, and everything else, but it's also the Matrix itself. It allowed everybody to just act. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's this kind of magic that happens when there's a film and then there's a role that fits the actor like a glove, right? So you really have to say kudos to the casting uh, director, whoever that was, but but the Wachowskis themselves, I'm sure, you know, played a big role in, in picking these specific individuals but you know it, it only happens so often with all the movies that are out there like where someone fits that role so well uh i mean very few people have that more than once right i mean i suppose you have you have that with john wick and uh you know keanu as well or or with harrison ford with han solo and indiana jones every now and then you'll get that happen more than once but really it tends to be a career defining moment and part of it is just you know it's it's like fits like a glove Right. And, and that's how we always, you know, remember them. And it happens with writers, too. Right. It happens with books. Right. Oftentimes there's one book that ends up being the defining book that they're remembered by, even though most writers might have written 10 books, for example. You know, no, that's true, though. That's true. And, and I, John Wick, all of them. Right. Great movies. Right. But you know who plays John Wick? Neo. <laughs> you don't even <laughs> say, right. You don't say Keanu Reeves. Right. right. And, and it's kind <laughs> of like if you think and it's it and that's okay. Right? Yeah. So you see Carrie Ann Moss and they're oh yeah, oh yeah, it's Trinity. Right. And and that's okay, right? Lawrence Fishburne will always be Morpheus. I don't care what the role is. And uh yeah, yeah. Very interesting take. I don't see I don't see Keanu um uh, as John Wick, I see Neo as John Wick. I've met Keanu uh, a few times, oh, a yeah. few times. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And uh, okay, here's here's one time that I met him. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this at the Nam Show, and I was the sales manager, national sales manager for uh, the amplifier company called Ashdown, and. And Keanu plays bass. The first time I met him, I sold him a bass. <laughs> and I watched him. This was at Guitar Center. I watched him strap the bass to his back and ride away on a motorcycle up Sunset Boulevard. I'm like, dude, that is so rock and roll, man. <laughs> wow. That was before the Matrix. That was before. Yeah. So later um, uh, at the NAMM show, and I'm standing there in a suit and this guy comes up and he goes, uh, so uh, can you tell me about this EQ? And, I, and I, I'm looking at his hand. I go, yeah. And I look at this guy, man. He's just standing <laughs> next to me by himself. Oh. By himself. And we sat and, and, and just rapped about stuff for, man, it was, it was a pretty good long time. 30 minutes, maybe, maybe an hour. And uh, just, just a down, just cool guy. Just, I, I, I can't say enough. But yeah, he's walking around the Nam show, man, by himself. Probably rode there on a motorcycle. Um, yeah, and you know, most people that have met him have you know similar stories about what an interesting and nice guy he is, especially given how recognizable you know he, he has become. Uh, I was just recently reading a, a biography of of James Cameron, um, and didn't realize that it was uh, you know one of his uh, one of his wives who actually gave Keanu his big break from a studio perspective. I mean, there was Bill and Ted, but I think point break was when, you know, the studios actually took a chance on him uh, and they didn't want to at first. Uh, but now I'm forgetting uh, the name of the, uh, of the woman that was uh, directing it. Uh, but uh, she was one of uh, James Cameron's wives and she insisted on, on, and she got Cameron to kind of pull weight with the studio <laughs> to, to, to let them, um, maybe it was Catherine Bigelow now that I think about it. <laughs> Now, I, here's a. I, I did this earlier today. Uh, now I'm going to have to do it by memory. Uh, I hope I don't get it wrong. But Johnny Depp, Val Kilmer, Will Smith, and there was a fourth, were all targeted and approached first to play Neo. 
and they all turned it down. Keanu was down on the list, man. Keanu was like the first that said yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that, that goes to show you, right, that, you know, sometimes there is uh, maybe a force at work here, right, whether we call it kismet or synchronicity uh, or fate that tends to pull people into certain positions or situations. I mean, imagine if Will Smith had become Neo, right? We wouldn't be talking about Neo. We'd be talking about Will Smith, right? <laughs> Uh, and so, so, you know, I, for one, I mean, I love Will Smith and, and his movies, but I, I, for one, I'm glad that, uh, it was Keanu that took that role. And I love Val Kilmer, Johnny Depp, right? Right. Yeah. But the, it would not, uh, Keanu own that role. And I think for everybody else, they wouldn't have owned it in the same way that, that he owned it, which obviously, uh, look what we have today. Right. Uh, yeah, and I think to a certain now, extent, you know, these, you know, there's that line in the movie "The Player," right? When they say, "Did you ever see that movie, The Player?" with uh, oh, Tim yeah. Robbins, both, where he goes, you know, "No stars, only talent," right? Yeah. <laughs> that line, but uh, but you know, I, I kind of feel like some of those guys would have overpowered the character with their own personality and being such big stars, whereas Keanu would just kind of melded right into it right it, it was like he's the avatar of neo neo is the avatar of him now uh let's let's get into some of uh these philosophical issues um that play out in this movie which is why i think it's affected so many because it transcended man i've been using that word a lot lately uh nearly every religion right and that's the other part for me, you have Neo almost like a Christ figure, but yet he's almost Buddha, right? <laughs> it's like it's like really weird. And then you have Zion, and you you know you have all of these uh, religious uh, feelings. I should say it's a, it's a it's a it's a taste, it's a flavor in in the movie. And that's a that's a big roll of the dice uh, to take that approach. But is that one of the reasons why so many people related to it uh, nearly immediately? I I think so. In that you know a lot of movies before the Matrix, and and I remember reading about this online as well, where you know they consider the Matrix almost philosophy disguised as a movie, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, in other movies, they might be trying to inject a little bit of philosophy or a little bit of religion in there. And, you know, I think, you know, Neo being like a religious figure for the Matrix has so many different implications and parallels, you know, throughout history, but also throughout, you know, philosophy. You've got the idea of Plato's cave, which goes back how many years now, right? 2,000 years plus where you know, most people have heard of Plato's cave by now, but the idea is that you're in a cave and uh, you're, you're uh, chained to one side of the cave and all you can see is the other side of the cave. And what's on that side are, reflect, are shadows from what's going on outside the cave, right? And so you know this idea that what we're seeing is not the real world, it's just shadows of what's actually happening and then he becomes, and Plato calls him a philosopher, right? But, you know, one guy escapes, right? He breaks his chains, he gets out, and he sees what the real world is like. And then he tries to come back, and he tries to explain to everybody else what he saw. And, of course, he can't. And in fact, they don't even want to believe it, right? Um, and, and so, you know, that is, is kind of what happens with a lot of religions in the beginning, I think, is, is somebody peaks outside of the simulation, outside of the physical world. And then they come back and try to tell people what actually happened, but you have to put it in words and you have to put it in metaphors. So in fact, you know, my next book is going to be called God and the Simulation. And it's going to be looking at different religious texts and show how they are connected to the ideas in the matrix, but also, you know, to the, the, the simulation hypothesis more generally. Because it's almost as if, if religions were to be founded today, they would use the language of the matrix as a way to describe things, right? I mean, Plato had to use a cave because what could he talk about when he's talking about the world around us? Is it necessarily real, right? And the Buddha used the metaphor of the dream. And so within Buddhism, that's a very strong 
a metaphor. And I was surprised when I saw that, you know, when I watched The Matrix again, right from the beginning, how often they use the dream metaphor, right? They use it even the first time they show up at Neo's door, right? Those, uh, uh, the people he was selling the, uh, you know, the viruses to, uh, they ask him, you know, whoa, man, you know, you look like, you know, something's wrong. And he, gets, and he says, uh, you ever have the feeling when you think you're going to wake up, <laughs> like you're in a dream and, and you're going to wake up. And, and then they continue that theme when he first meets Morpheus, right? That whole idea that the world is like a dream. And it, it, it goes through the entire movie. But that was a metaphor that people could understand, you know, 2000 years ago. Uh, but today we've got different metaphors. You know, we have video games as a technology. We have computers as technologies. And we have phone lines, right? We, we have uh, text messages. And so I think re most religions, you know, have this idea of how to express what's, what's called ineffable, right? Which is that something that can't be explained. This is the problem that a lot of near-death experiencers had, right? Is they saw something and they couldn't explain what it was. To the people that were still there before you know these terms came about that we use normally within them so i think there's there's serious religious overtones and i think that is something that many people could relate to but without being too stuck to any specific religion right i mean so if if you know he was explicitly uh, a christian figure or an islamic right uh, you know messiah think i don't think it would have worked as well and i don't think as many people would have but they called him, him, you remember, uh, they kept, re you know, uh, is he the one? He's the one. Yeah. Are you the one? I'm the, you know, that's the other part yeah. where this, uh, you know, without, you know, pick a religion, but it's like this Christ figure. And if, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Now, if we back up, though, um, and go back to your point. Uh, Cypher, uh, or Agent Smith, now I'm paraphrasing here, but there was an explanation that Agent Smith does about the Matrix and, and the machines. And he says something like, um, I don't have uh, the full quote in front of me or anything, but um, I've seen the movie way too many times to even know something like this. He says, he says something like, well, we originally built the Matrix as a utopia but humans weren't happy and we tried to create this perfect world for them where there was no stress and there was none of that and that didn't work we couldn't control the humans so then we designed it to be like 1999 <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 it's a heck of a line and and once uh, and Agent Smith uh, explains it like that, that uh, humans exposed to this artificial world that had issues in it, right? Not a perfect utopia, but everything else that goes on. And therefore, um, when Neo starts to question uh, what if he's in the Matrix or not and what is reality and what isn't, it's because it wasn't utopia. Right. There was yes. nothing there to give him a clue uh, about it until um, and I'm going to I'm going to give somebody credit here. Ada uh, Nekademu. That was the actress. With the white rabbit tattoo. Ah. OK. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> now she's got one line in the movie. And man, she nailed it, right? So anyway, when that door cracks open and he says... It'll be fun, I promise, right? Isn't that... Yeah, 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 yeah. And have you ever had a dream that... And he goes, yeah, man, all the time. It's called mescaline, right? So that's that's the line. Yeah. And uh, should we take him with this? Yeah, absolutely, right? And But Trinity had just typed, follow the white rabbit. And then he sees the white rabbit on her shoulder. He's thinking about the computer. Now this isn't. And that was like the beginning. And, and I like the, the whole Alice in Wonderland uh, tie-in, you know, jumping down the rabbit hole and changing your reality. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you just made two really important and deep points there, Jimmy, and we could talk about those for the rest of the show. But on the first point there about it being a utopia, so this is you know a question that I get asked often when I talk about the idea that we live inside a simulation. In fact, I just posted a clip on Twitter today where George Nuri was asking me specifically this, right? And th the question that I get asked is, you know, if we live in a computer simulation, why do we have suffering? Why do we have pain? Basically, why does it suck, right? And because people say to me, well, if I were to design the simulation, I would make it so that it is a utopia. I would make myself have everything that I wanted, right? I would be a billionaire, I'd be a movie star, or best-selling author, whatever it is that you you want. Uh, so therefore, this is unlikely to be, you know, a simulation. And 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 the answer to that is in that line of Agent Smith, right? Which is not only didn't it work, but humans wouldn't accept that as real, right? And this is actually a key part, I think, that ties the religious ideas, right? Because people say this all the time, well, how can there be a God if there's so much suffering in the world, right? So it ties the idea of relig religion that the world is not real, but the world has a lot of suffering. And, you know, we, we were on the show last year talking about my book, Wisdom of a Yogi. I was talking about Swami Yogananda, right? And he used to say, ceaseless joy is not the nature of this world, right? But he used to also make the point that, you know, just because you die inside, uh, they say the dream world, you don't necessarily, your soul doesn't necessarily die. There's still part of you that's outside of the simulation. And so where it ties to video games is there's a rule in the video game world. Right. So if you want a video game to be really engaging, and this rule comes from pretty much the grandfather of the video game industry, who's Nolan Bushnell, who was the founder uh, of Atari. And the rule was make it easy to play, but difficult to master. Right. Uh, because if it's easy to play, they'll get into it. But if it's so easy to master, you get bored with mm -hmm. that right away. Right. You Why revolt. You, you revolt. You throw it in the garbage. You stop playing. You, all of those, just like the utopia version of the Matrix, right? That only lasts for so long before yeah. everybody revolts, and that's and 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 that's what happened. The, I said, let let's stay on this for a second. The movie with the storyboards. And the way that the Wachowskis, I'm not going to say brothers, let's just go with the Wachowskis, right? <laughs> the way that the Wachowskis, uh, they, uh, the comic fans, um, uh, uh, movie fans, director fans, framing fans, and they wanted all of these extreme angles and shadows and these crazy things. And it was all storyboarded out. And when you look at the original storyboards, and you move that over to the film. They captured that stuff. They really did, man. Agent Smith with the long shadows and and, and all of the, it's it's it went from storyboard this comic uh, way of doing stuff. Uh, it, it transferred well, and it was done differently, which captured the audience. So were the other part? How did the Wachowskis write these deep philosophical things? into a screenplay and still think about bullet time, camera shots, storyboarding, framing, colors, uh, costumes, and everything else, or were these deep philosophical parts on us? Did we just add that to the film, right? That it wasn't written into the film, but that's what we got out of it. Well, I don't know. I think they were thinking about the philosophy, right? That, that you, you really do. You and, really I mean, you don't think it was an accident. Okay. The, All the right. fact that there was, okay, in that same scene, right, just before Neo answers the door, he pulls uh, the little computer thing out of a book, right? And do you know what book that was? Yeah, it, it was, uh, it was, um, uh, I, I, it's right on the tip of my tongue. It was simulation and simulacra. Yes, by yes, John yes. Baudelard, and it was a, a who was like a philosopher. was like a philosopher of technology. Now later, he said he wasn't sure that they totally understood what was in that book. But the fact that that book was included shows that they were thinking about this idea and they were looking at how. And at, at that point in time, that was probably one of the few books. 
right? Think about that. If if it was released in 99, they were filming it right through 98, 97. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, they probably mm-hmm. wrote it in like 96, 95, right? And, they, and you know, sometimes uh, a direct directors in this case, or a director like James Cameron had been thinking about Avatar since he was, you know, 12 years old, right? So they've been thinking about something for a very long time. So I, I do believe you're right about the visuals though. I think but he said, the story, but he said, <laughs> He said, he said, no, they got, they got my ideas wrong. I don't see it in the movie. You know, yeah, even though right. his book is there. Yeah, that's right. Because his ideas were less about the idea of living in the simulation. Like if you go and read that book, it's actually a pretty hard book to read. It's tiny. You think, oh yeah, I'll just read it. But it's like a philosophy book, right? So it, it and he's an academic, right? I think it was published by University of Michigan Press or something. And but but the ideas were more about representing something as a symbol, and how does that symbol relate to the reality? So you know, his main points I think weren't necessarily that we live inside, uh, you know, an artificial world made of simulation. But at that point in time, there were very few books that were exploring this idea. There was Philip K. Dick's speech, right? Uh, in uh, back in uh, in, in France, 1977, in 1977, yep. in Metz, France, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was uh, Simulacron Three, which, by the way, was the basis for another simulation movie that came out in that same year, in 1999, and everybody forgets about it, uh, which is the Thirteenth Floor, was the which we've floor. discussed many times on the show. Yeah, we have yeah. absolutely. So there was that, but that was a, a fictional, you know, book, and it was being made in a movie. At, it wouldn't have been appropriate for them to use that. And so, uh, you know, there just weren't that many books out there. Now, after The Matrix came out, you know, people started to develop these philosophical ideas. And in the DVD release, which you were talking about, especially with the the second and third movies, they actually had a little documentary that was about the philosophy. And they invited like real philosophers, like academic philosophers, like David Chalmers, um, you know, on to, uh, into that. And there was an actual book published I think I still still have, oh, here's one, one of these books that was published in the 2000s, Philosophers Explore the Matrix, right? So there were a whole bunch of these types of things that went on after it was released. But the, the Wachowskis were pretty supportive of this. And in fact, they asked Chalmers, who's like, you know, a world-class, uh, you know, philosopher. And in fact, he was uh, thinking about this matrix hypothesis in the same year that Nick Bostrom came up with the terminology of the simulation hypothesis, right? And in fact... Uh, Chalmers said, well, eventually everybody just began using the simulation term. So I gave in <laughs> and I'll use the simulation. But but they asked him to write essays for the website of the matrix. So they were actually asking real philosophers to write actual academic type essays or, you know, slightly less academic, but more for, for popular consumption. And so clearly it was on their minds, certainly as they were making the sequels. And, and I believe it was on their minds, uh, you know, when they were making the, the first movie. Well, isn't it easy for somebody who thinks they are a philosopher to philosophize on anything? Well, it's, yeah. Right, right. It, it, you yeah. only need a subject. Uh, okay. Right? Oh, oh, dude, they're going to go off and wax philosophical <laughs> on this. And, and so you're given the gift of the matrix. But you could philosophy, you know, go at the original Batman TV series and Catwoman and go deeply philosophical on that. Um, so I'm not so sure. Maybe, and this is this is my take. You yeah. get from art what you get from it, right? You don't That's have true. to, th- yeah. you know, you don't have to get uh, uh, Van Gogh's ear getting cut off. Right. Whether you know and and how it's expressed in his paintings, it's what what you get out of it, and mm-hmm. and maybe the Wachowskis just got lucky. Well, that's, I think that's, the, that's, the difficult thing that they did there, and and this gets to your point earlier about how amazing it is that the storyboards had the visuals in there, was that they were able to connect the philosophy with the visuals right, with a storyline, right, and dialogue that we're still quoting today, right? I mean, we're all quoting, you know, I mean, I quote Morpheus all the time, you know, even in that scene I talked about earlier in the construct, he goes, do you think that's air you're breathing right now? (laughs) 
<laughs> and I quote that. So I teach a class at Arizona State University about the simulation hypothesis, which is called religion, philosophy, science fiction, and te technology, right? So it's like across all of those things. But I think the difficult task, sometimes you have a good idea, but it doesn't make it into a script that has a great story. So they were able to connect the philosophy into the storyline. And I think that's what makes it easy for people to philosophize about these different aspects, right? I mean, there's also a lot there about AI we haven't even gotten into yet. So it's not just about the virtual reality aspect. There are so many other aspects, uh, you know, of this that that come into play when you're talking about it. So, so, so my belief is, you know, they did have some of these ideas in mind when they were writing the script, but uh, you know, you you don't necessarily know when you're writing something that this is going to be the one, if you will, right? And so it was a confluence of events. And this gets to your second point. Uh, you also mentioned uh, in in with, earlier about the white rabbit and how Trinity was sending him a message to say, look for the white rabbit. Now, what is that? That's a synchronicity, right, that's happening. And if you don't know how these synchronicities are occurring in your life, you get, I like to call those clues, going way back to when you and I had our first show. Uh, you know, I talked about the treasure hunt of life, and you've got these clues that are directing you. It's almost like you've got people like, you know, Morpheus and Trinity that are watching you and they're sending you these little messages, except they don't come, you know, necessarily in your computer. They come as intuitions. They come as synchronicity. But that was so weird. And so Neo wasn't going to go to the party. And then he saw that white rabbit. Right. And so this is a case where we in our lives, sometimes we get a message. Right. Not necessarily on the screen, but we get it internally. And then there's something externally that relates to that. And we're not sure if that means anything to us. But the fact that they were incorporating, you know, synchronicity into this film back all the way in 1999, I think is 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 pretty amazing, you know? Well, okay. So, yeah, ignorance is bliss. And the, <laughs> that, that quote from Cypher, if we look at it, when he's spinning, you know, he's got the steak, right, on the fork, and he's looking at it, and he's like, you know, uh, uh, this steak doesn't actually exist. You know, uh, I know I know that when I put it in my mouth, it's juicy. And, uh, you know, he says something like, the Matrix is telling me that it tastes good. And, you know, after all this time, uh, I, I don't give a crap. You know what I realize? <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. Right? And, it's... And that's, that's had become one of my favorite scenes and lines. And I got to say, the first time I saw it, I just saw him as another villain, right? Uh, but the more you watch this movie, so in my class, I, we, we watch that scene just by itself because it's such a, a rich scene. But there's actually a philosopher, his name was uh, Robert Nozick, I think, who created a thought experiment back in the 70s called the Experience Machine. And so we asked students this. And so here's the thought experiment I'd like your, your listeners and viewers to, to take. If you could put on a virtual reality headset, and once you got in there, you, would, you could be anybody you wanted to be, right? But you would completely forget that there's a part of you that's outside the machine. Would you live the rest of your life in this virtual reality being whoever you wanted, whatever success you wanted. Uh, and you would just forget or not be aware that there was a physical world around you. And then later he had a slightly revised version is what if you could do this for two years, right? And so this is a question I'd like you know people to think about. If you could do this for two years, would you do it? Would you go into this virtual reality so completely like Cypher wanted to do where you could enjoy everything that's there and you wouldn't have to deal with all this other stuff? And what they found was when they did surveys, and there are like academic philosophy papers on this, was that most people said no, right? Even though they could do anything they wanted to, because there's still value and element of reality. But I think this hits at one of those key philosophical issues that the first time you watch it, you know, you're just like, yeah, whatever, he's a bad guy, right? Uh, he, he's betraying the rest of the team, you know? But but this last time when I saw it, you really see it. I think you mentioned this earlier, Jimmy, how... Uh, he, you know, they had that set up right from the first scene, right? I mean, they mentioned him without using his name right in the, almost the very first line uh, in the movie. Itself. Yeah, you're, you're right about that, though. Just go, um, if you really want to test this thought experiment, go on a cruise. 
Go on a cruise. Go on a cruise ship, okay, where everything, everything is taken care of, right? You eat when you want to eat. You sleep when you want to sleep. You drink when you want to drink. You walk when you want to walk. You do whatever it is. But everything, and and you know what? After about after about five days, right? And you get to day six and day seven, you're like, poof, man. And and you can't wait to get off that ship. You know, and what you know, you go into a, a restaurant that literally has everything all at once. <laughs> Breakfast. Breakfast in France, <laughs> breakfast in China, whatever, lunch, burgers, steaks, fish, seafood, Italian, anything, Mexican, any f- style of food that you could, th- and it's all right in front of you. And at first, right? Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. You get around to day five of that, and you just want life's problems back. Right, you want to get back to reality. You want to get back to fighting, <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> right. You yeah, want to go get stuck in traffic. Whatever. It yeah. gets back to the 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 first Matrix being a utopia, right, and not having any challenges or anything. That's exactly it. Yeah. Like like it's almost like for us that that's not the nature of this world, and that's not what makes us kind of want to live life, even though we think it is. If 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 we're asked that, but so this experiment. You know, usually, and I did it in my class as well, and it was usually about 70% of the people say no, and, you know, 25 to 30% say yes, you know, I would do it for if it was only two years, if it was for the rest of my life, physical life, I don't think I would do that, right? And and so so it, it's, an, it's an interesting experiment, but the, the way they explain it is it shows that, you know, hedonism and pleasure isn't the only thing we value, right? We also value truth. We value other types of experiences, and perhaps we unconsciously value challenges. Uh, and I think that's why this world is set up as it is, with the nature of suffering, you know, in the world. Um, and you know, I mentioned Yogananda earlier, and and, and he got that message when he saw screen uh, these uh, movie reels of World War One, and you know, that was the first mechanized war, and they called it the Great War for a reason. No, nobody had seen that many people killed like, you know, in, in such a short period of time before with the mechanized artillery. And, and he started crying. He's like, well, why do you allow this suffering? Lord, why would you do this? And, and the answer he got back was, you know, think of it as like a movie. You know, what makes a movie interesting? It's to have the struggles. Who wins the Oscars? Or you don't win an Oscar for a part that has no struggle. And that's just, you know, you go in there and you don't do anything. You know, everything is great for you, right? The, the, the roles that you play, the experiences that you want to have within a virtual reality or within a game are ones that will have some level of struggle uh, because that's what makes life interesting. I think. The, um, uh, the, the issue... Uh, that the matrix presented about AI and we'll, we'll get deeper into this later, but uh, when Cypher and agent Smith and, and, and everybody's having the conversation about utopia in the original um, and now the new version, when um, uh, using humans as a power source for the existence of the machines, so they can exist where the roles were reversed. And when Neo looks and sees all of the batteries, right? And he views the matrix and it's going on forever. And he's just, right? He's just a battery, gets flushed down a toilet, right? Right, right, right. right. And and then the the film, I think that's why everybody relates to it so much and and is also having such a a hard time with AI today and and where we are but but are we just fodder right are we just something to the system that can be flushed down a toilet when our use is up i think everybody can relate to that yeah i think i i think you're right in that uh uh you know this issue of ai and being using us 
right, is, is something that's, uh, I think there's, there's something deep in the human psyche about this, right? Because it, it's been a trope within science fiction for so long, uh, you know, going back to Metropolis, right? <laughs> in fact, the, the, the term robot, right? If you look at the, it was a Czech term, right, from a particular play, a Rustum's Universal Robots. They were created as slaves, right, <laughs> uh, to do the work of humans. And so, you know, the, there's this idea of the, the slaves rebelling, right, going back. That makes people nervous in different societies. And so, you know, that's such a theme through science fiction all the way through the Terminator. Uh, just today, uh, I was writing a, a, an article for, for CNN, actually, about AI. And I was quoting the scene from 2001 where, you know, uh, Hal, the AI, says, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. Right? Uh, and that was the time that where, you know, it was an uncooperative AI. And so, but I think with The Matrix, it was done in such an ingenious and interesting way where, you know, if you watch that speech where Neo is, is still in that construct and he's showing uh, Morpheus and he's showing uh, the actual uh, in the screen, this is the world today. And he's explaining the history of it. Uh, in fact, nowadays, you know, with Vision Pro or other augmented reality devices, there's a, there's a time when they move from the construct out into what the physical world looks like. And he said, this is what the world looks like today. What was the year? I think it was 21, was it 2199? Was, was the actual or somewhere around there? And he says, the reason is we don't know exactly because sometime in the early 21st century, we perfected AI and then it fought back against us. And I think you know, that has such resonance, one with the matrix having come out literally at the cusp of the new century and the new millennium having come out in 1999, but it's kind of where we are today as well. So you know, I think this idea of the robots rebelling and perhaps using us, I mean, what's the line that Neo uses, I'm sorry, that Morpheus uses to find, he says, you, know, you, you find the truth is that you are a slave, right? That's the truth. I didn't say it would be easy. Uh, I just said it would be the truth. Yeah. Now, what, the the term being pilled, you know, red pill, red, you know, the red pill, the blue pill, has become synonymous for so many different things. And uh, you can attribute all of that to the matrix. And it, does it surprise you that uh, it has become a part of uh, pop culture so much and conversation and thought processes and provoking people and, and trying to get people to understand or open up your mind or to check your reality, whatever it is, that as this moves through the future, the attribution back to the matrix is going to be lost. But right now you and I understand where red pill and blue pill have, have come from. And it is literally a part of our lifestyle now, isn't it? It really is. And I think that's, it shows the impact of this film uh, in, in a way that other films haven't really had that impact. And uh, you know, when I was in the, uh, college, I, I started reading more Shakespeare, even though I was a computer science major at MIT. So get, you know, uh, a very geeky school, right? 70% engineering. I started reading a lot of Shakespeare while I was there. And I realized, oh my God, there's so many lines from Shakespeare that we use in everyday English that most of us don't know that these lines, you know, came from Shakespeare originally. Um, and and there's there's so many like that that they, they've become part of daily usage. And I think, you know, in ancient times, it was the mythology and the scriptures that played that role. And then you had Shakespeare uh, and literature in certain times. And today it's it's movies that are the cultural uh, kind of touchstone. It's the the underpinnings that we all share. So we want when we want to make a point, Right, you make a point using a, a particular reference that everyone just in the same way that they might have talked about Zeus and Apollo, or you know, we're entering on the field of Mars. If you ever watch that that show Rome from HBO, right? They'll just invoke the gods left and right for various things, and it's because it's such a it's a shared cultural reference that everybody will get. They don't have to explain Mars is the god of war. They just said we're entering the fields of Mars, and I think that's happening with the Matrix as well. Now with the red pill. 
it was surprising to me originally that it started to be used for these many different versions, right? I mean, I write about the simulation hypothesis, which is uh, the hard simulation, right? Meaning that the physical world is itself a simulation. But then there's the soft simulation hypothesis, which is that we are being lied to about lots of things inside the physical world. So it's like another level. And so, you know, when you go back and you look at that speech, the saying that, you know, uh, from Morpheus to Neo before he takes uh, the pill, you know, he, he says that the wool has been pulled over, pull over your eyes to hide from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison you cannot taste or smell or touch. A prison for your mind, right? And he said, this is your last chance <laughs> to not see that. And so I'm now that I go back and watch 25 years later that scene, I'm not so uh, surprised that red pill is being used in so many different ways. It's when we think that there's something that's been, you know, that's been hidden from us. But even before he gets into, you know, he takes the red pill, he doesn't say the matrix is a video game, the matrix is a computer simulation. He says the matrix is control. I always thought that was a weird line, right? Um, but that's where I think it 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 it's, it it's ties to all the different uses of red pill <laughs> that 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 are out there, right? And you got people across the political spectrum and uh, using that term. But I, I do think you're right. I do think it's one of those terms that, you know, people will forget where it came from. Like, you know, even cyberspace is, you know, what we use it for today is not what was in the actual novel. I mean, I, you know, I, I study science well, fiction. That's, that's yeah. true. That's true. That's true. And when you say it enough, yeah. you develop your own definition for it and your own technique for the use of the word or or the saying. Like, it, even, even the matrix, right? How many times? You know, when you see somebody 14, 15 years old, the movie yeah. is in its 25th anniversary, right? Yeah. And you see somebody, man, you know, oh, man, I got to unplug from the matrix. <laughs> they haven't seen the movie. They haven't. Right? You're, you're right. Absolutely you know right. what yeah. I mean? You know, oh man, you're in the matrix, man. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta unplug. And it's, it's, it's there. It's developed into its own thing with its own definition and its own term. And you don't necessarily have to see the movie to use the word. And that's where pop culture. That's how strong, how much of an impact the movie has had on us. Yeah, you know, when the new, the the fourth Matrix film came out, uh, Resurrections, there was an interview with Keanu where he was talking we at a friend's house and, uh, you know, their their son or daughter had never seen the Matrix, right? And they were like, well, what's that about? And he had to like explain it, right? What the actual movie was about. And it, it was interesting because they knew the the concept because it's just out there, I think. But but to, to and, and when he said, you have to explain, escape from this video game, this guy, he's in this computer simulation and he escapes. And the teenager goes, well, so what's the big deal about that? Like, it's just a concept that everybody understands now. That's not shocking. That's pretty much how it is, right? Many people think that's how it is today. And another way that it gets invoked is often, you know, uh, in terms of religious memes, like the, the simulators, right? The simulators don't want us to do that, or the simulators want us to do that, right? And so, you know, that, even though we're using the term simulation, a lot in, in 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 memes. I call it the first meme religion. It's really all because of the Matrix, right? That 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 analogy is 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 so widespread. Uh, terminology, which by the way was inspired by Philip K. Dick. So a lot of this comes back, you know, to Philip K. Dick. And I might have said this on your show before, but when I interviewed his wife Tessa, I asked her what what would Philip K. Dick have thought of the Matrix, you know? And she said, well, first of all, he would have liked it, like like he would have loved it. And the second thing he would say is can I call my agent and sue these guys for taking some of my ideas? <laughs> and, you know, it's like these ideas become embedded, uh, you know, within <laughs> first the genre and now I think in, in broader, in broader society. The, uh, the way that uh, these ideas start to uh, lay out when, uh, uh, you know, when they finally capture Neo and, uh, they handcuff him. You remember they put him in the car, and Trinity's the behind him on on the motorcycle, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and so they're in the interrogation room, and nobody really knows at this point, and that includes Neo, um, 
really what's going on yet. Right, it hasn't happened. You remember when he pit, he gets the the FedEx package and the phone is there? Morpheus, yes, it's me. Right, okay. And so after that, when they're in the interrogation room, and uh, Agent Smith says, um, <clears throat> "Let me clear my throat." It seems that you've been living two lives. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great invitation yeah. yeah one life you're thomas a anderson program writer for a respectable software company you have a social security number pay your taxes and you help your landlady out with her garbage the other life is lived in computers where you go by the hacker alias neo and are guilty of virtually every computer crime we have a law for. One of these lives has a future. One of them does not. And he closes the folder, right? (laughs) And and it's like right there, um, uh, Neo, uh, that sounds like a really good deal, right? I forget what he says. Uh, How about I give you the finger, right? (laughs) (laughs) I got to say, I always forget that scene. And then I watch it again, and I'm always surprised by that scene that he has the balls to do that when he doesn't really know what the heck is going on at that stage, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, uh, um, it, it, uh, it's going to be hard to scream when you can't speak, right? <laughs> or something like that. And you remember his mouth, right? Go, yeah. that's where. Uh, things take the turn in the movie where it's like, oh, crap, okay, all right. When you think you're watching the reality, right, the dance club, the computer, the thing, the office, right, where he almost gets fired and and, and the cube, no, you think that that is the reality, and that's not, but right? Do you know they, they left other interesting clues? Like, what is the name of this respectable tech company? Something I only noticed when watching it recently. I never noticed it before. What was it? It was called Meta Cortex. Okay. <laughs> oh, really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. If you watch it, there's just a short scene when he gets to work where you can see it on the building. And it's like, oh, wow. Here we are. Okay. Cortex, Meta, Metaverse, Neo Cortex. I mean, you've got all these little clues. And then his, his, uh, his, on his floor, Okay, again, I noticed this just for the first time. 25 years later, I finally noticed it. The name of his group that he works for is right on the wall when he's, you know, uh, when, when uh, Morpheus is he's crawling. Him. Crawling. Yeah, yeah. You see it. It's the Cortex, T E C H. It's like tech support or something, but it's like the Cortex, right? <laughs> and they just keep <laughs> hammering in this point that you are inside the mind or you are inside something inside your mind. And, and, but it's, they leave these little clues that we just don't pick up on them like the first time that we see it you know I, I, there are so many great uh, you know i don't want to do a commercial screw it let's just keep going um there are so many great quotes in the movie and um i'm i'm going to say this this is the first movie not so much yeah. the 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 next three right but the first movie i was in love with carrie ann moss no i was in love with trinity i should trinity. say yeah. 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 There was something about her um, that love is not the right word, but everybody understands what I'm saying. She had this attitude um, about her. She was fit. You remember in the opening scene where she goes something like, is this a, is this a secure line? Yes. It's a secure line. I heard something. What did you hear? Right. And, and then she ends up, running around the walls and doing the karate. And that kind of set the tone. Remember when she was running across the buildings, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Right. And doing all of that. Okay. That version of Trinity when uh, is only in the first movie, she kind of changes uh, in the next two, but it's that scene in the dance club. It's that scene in the dance club when she comes up and she goes, my name is Trinity. And Neo goes, what? The Trinity? <laughs> right? The one that right. the, the one that hacked the IRS D base? <laughs> oh, that was a long time ago. And he's yeah. like, man. And she goes, what? And he goes, 
I always thought you were a, a dude. Or I forget. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's right. Something she like goes, that, right? Yeah. yeah, she goes, most guys do. <laughs> <laughs> right, which, you know, gets into this issue of who is the real person behind the identity, right, that is presented online. And it was that, you that it was you on my computer, right? And, right. and he starts he starts to unravel um, all of that. So now um, uh, I wanted to ask you this: I, I I don't know for sure. I should have looked this up. Um, uh, that dance club scene, the music that's playing, it sounds like it's Rob Zombie. All right, and I, and. I, I, I don't know for sure. I should look this up. Um, somebody looked that up. What, what was the music from the dance club scene uh, when Trinity meets Neo for the first time? And that's playing in the background. Mm. And that is Dragular. Dragular? Blade Rave. Are those? It is Rob Zombie. Okay. Somebody just said, yeah, it's Rob Zombie. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it's Dragula. Is it Dragula or is it Ro Living Dead Girl, Rob Zombie? Thank you, Jonicide. Jonicide is my music guy. Thank you. For there that. you go. Living Dead Girl. Okay. Now that's interesting okay. too, right? <laughs> Living Dead Girl. Yeah, yeah. Is, the name, is the name of the song, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. That, that is what the future sounds like. Right? Man, I kind of sounded like Ancient Smith there for a second. I, I think I just figured it out. That's my radio persona. In my <laughs> mind, I think I'm Agent Smith. That's maybe where it came I am. from. Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I am. That's your online identity. There you go. <laughs> now, uh, uh, okay. There was another character that doesn't get film credits. And that's the sunglasses. Not, mm -hmm. I want you to think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. Every character had custom-made sunglasses, right? This designer came in, and everybody had their own pair. And if we go and look um, here, right? So everybody here has got their own sunglasses. Morpheus, right. remember his only stuck to his nose? Remember yeah. that? Yep. Remember that? Remember that? Carrie Ann Moss with those, right? Yeah. These were all custom made sunglasses. And which was a very interesting. Okay, hold on. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Right? Right. Nice. Everybody had their own sunglasses. And based on and their personality a little bit too, right? It's not it's just the shape. Yeah. Right, right. And where um let's just keep this going. I think this is a very, very important point. I think that is should have had their own film credit as an actor. That this made as much of an impact in the movie uh, uh, for everybody as anything else. The costumes were great. Neo's jacket and Trinity's black plastic jumpsuit, whatever you want to call that thing, right? Morpheus. But it's these sunglasses that really had an impact for me. Hmm. Well, they are the epitome of cool when you look at these sunglasses, right? And, uh, you know, the, the, the movie is pretty dark overall, right? And yet they're wearing these sunglasses. And it, it kind of, to me, it, it kind of presents almost as if you're seeing, like these guys, are they're seeing something slightly different than we're seeing, right? I mean, they're looking through these sunglasses. It's like a filter on the world. You know, how later, uh, for me, you know, the scene later where Neo finally starts to see the matrix while he's inside the matrix and you have like the three agents and green and you have the green, you know, the green characters everywhere. But there's a famous scene where he looks down the hallway and he, and he sees them as digital images rather than images. And, and, and for me, this idea of what you see is not what's real is actually a very key part of, of the movie and the philosophy and, and why I think it's made such an impact. So it's interesting. Like for me, that when I saw it the first time, the sunglasses were just part of the costume. I didn't think any more of it. But then over time, you know, you start to realize that, you know, how you see the world, right, depends on the lenses that you're looking through. 
Uh, yeah, but well, even even Agent Smith, right? And uh, he's he's got his own view and his own take on things. And in the end, Agent Smith wants out too, right? right? Well, well, that's one of the fascinating, you know, another fascinating element of the whole uh, story with Agent Smith and Cipher, and and in the end, you know, there's this question of can AI escape the matrix, right? So if we have AI inside of a simulation, inside of one of our virtual worlds, will it be able to escape outside of that? And there's a lot of serious AI research, you know, going on about this this topic. In fact, there's a there was a computer scientist named uh, uh, Roman Yompolsky uh, who wrote an article, a, t- a technical article, an academic paper about hacking the matrix. And he's an AI researcher, and his particular expertise is, in fact, how do you keep AI in a box, right, so that it doesn't escape out, right? And he uses that as an analog for if we are in the matrix, if if we are actually inside a simulation. And we are AI. Now, a lot of the academics who talk about being in the matrix, you've heard me talk about this before, Jimmy. I won't belabor it, but for me, one of the most important points of the simulation hypothesis is the NPC versus RPG versions of the simulation theory. And they're not completely exclusive, right? You can have NPCs, non-player characters, along with avatars of your actual, of the players, kind of working together into it. But he's come to the conclusion that you, we're not going to be able to keep AI in a box. It's going to escape, right, uh, looking at the AI we're creating. And what's interesting is in the matrix, you have this happening at multiple levels, right? You have the AI that the humans created, which is keeping the humans in the box, but they also have the programs in that simulation in the matrix that they created. And then Agent Smith is the, is the one that wants to get out and infects a body, if you were, outside of the matrix. And so you've got even AI can't keep AI in the box, right? Right, 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 right. And and that was their whole, um, I mean, the agents were there to contain viruses or those that were uh, attempting to escape the matrix. And nobody understands what the matrix is, including the viewers of the film. Now, if you think about it, the way that it starts off in the beginning, you know, back to that scene with um, uh, uh, Carrie Ann Moss, right? Rob Zombie at the club. And uh, I'm going to try to get this right, but um, Neo says something, I'm paraphrasing, says something like, he says, what is the matrix? And she goes, that's the question that drives us. Right. That's why we are here. That's that was pretty, you know, um, you know what I mean? Because as as the viewer of the film, yeah. the, the film is called The Matrix. Yes. Right. And Neo is is trying to figure out. And, and that's that kind of like sets the tone for everything. But if we look back at Red Pill and reality and unplug your mind is this air real? What are we doing? We're on the Nebuchadnezzar. We're, uh, we're deep under all of this stuff is suggesting something else, another reality. And it keeps you guessing which one you're in, which one is the matrix. Right. And that's, right. that's it. And Carrie Ann Moss says it really, really well, you know, that, 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 that's the question that brought us here. Right. right? That brings that's us right. together. Yeah. And in fact, you know, that was what the, the line that they used in the marketing, right? Uh, which is what is the matrix, right? Uh, it was such a crucial and important line for that first part of the movie, but it's also what we're thinking while we're watching the movie. So you have us in the same boat as Neo. And I think they did a masterful job, right? Of trying to figure out what the matrix is. But I think it, it gets back to the big, big philosophical and religious questions, right? What is reality, right? That's the thing that, that's occupied us, you know, for thousands and thousands of years. But this is a technological spin. So it's really techno philosophy is, is, is what the matrix is, is about. It uses these technological metaphors to try to ask 
these fundamental questions that have been being asked for for thousands of years down the road. But but you know the fact that this movie came out in the '90s, right when the internet was relatively new in '99, right it had been out for a few years. The web, I mean, the internet had been around for 20 years, but the web, which is how most people you know came to, again terminology changes, right? When people talk about the internet, they're often just talking about the web, which is just one service on the protocol stack that became known as uh, as the internet. Uh, but but it was it was uh, a time of technological change, and we live in a time of technological change today too. But it was a time of a certain kind of computer based technological change, uh, and you know, Matrix kind of implies something technological just from the term of it, right? Like, what is a Matrix? Where does that that terminology come from, right? Uh, from mathematics, perhaps, right? And what is a what is a simulated world, but mathematics rendered on the screen, right? In, in geometrical shapes and things. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that was a key moment. Yeah. But look, look, is tasty wheat like cream of wheat? One of the best lines in the movie, man. Oh man. Uh, that, that scene uh, with mouse and dozer and tank and switch when they're all sitting around uh, eating, and he's he he has uh, um, Stacy. Thank you for that. That's, that's Stacy. We like cream of wheat. I love that scene because um, if you think about it, Neo he's getting introduced to the crew. He goes on that simulation ride, and he walks down the street, and he sees the the redhead walk right. by him. Right, yep. um, the, the streets of Sydney. By the way, it wasn't shot in 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 the United States. But anyway, um, Mouse turns to him after the tasty wheat, <laughs> and it's such a great line. So you dig the redhead? He's my <laughs> creation, right? Yeah. Or oh, the woman? She, it was a woman in red. She was actually a blonde yeah, a woman in red. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, the woman in red. Right. Yeah, she was blonde. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you're and so you're looking at him right. as this skinny nerd dweeb yeah. that has created his sex uh pot cipher chick, right? And uh, okay, all right, you know, but then he waxes philosophical. And he says something like, "Man, I said it to you earlier. I can't remember now, but he says something like to deny to deny ourselves our pleasure is what makes us human or not to deny, you not know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> and over yeah. right after the tasty wheat thing, right. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Where yeah. and this, there's yep. this constant duality going on. Yeah. And, and then the bigger question is, was the physical world outside the matrix actually also a matrix, right? Because if you think about it, and, and, and Morpheus makes this clear even in the first movie. He goes, in the first version of The Matrix, there was a man who could change the Matrix. He could create whatever he wanted and manipulate. And that became the basis for the legend that he will return. Right. So now we're, 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 we're heavy into religious ideas here, right? Uh, I mean, religions are often founded by individuals who are said to perform miracles, right, who can change the physical world. Right, whether you go back to Jesus or you go back even further, or you go to the Indian traditions, you see you see this. Uh, but so the story was planted, right? And and this ties to another science fiction that's out now, which is Dune, right? Which is all about a messiah. So if you've watched Dune Part Two, which just came out, uh, or if you read the book, but they, they the Fremen who are the desert uh, tribes, they have a legend of a messiah. Right, and that turns out that that legend was was placed by, in this case, a particular group of of women priestesses called the Bene Gesserit. But but the legend was placed there, and so when when Morpheus talks about there's a legend of the one, and that's their basis for belief of the one is the one who can, uh, you know, who can uh, break out of the matrix and free people, right? And, and that was the guy who originally freed some people, Morpheus said as well. Well, when Neo finally, when they break out, Neo still has kind of a special role, even outside the Matrix, right? Uh, in the second, now we're, now we're in the second and third movies at this point, right? 
So is the outside also a matrix where Neo being the savior of the physical human race, like that's just another level, just like your level about the, you know, when we talk about the tasty weed or you talk about the food in the quote unquote physical world versus a cipher tasting the steak right inside the matrix is, is the cream of wheat also just inside another level. And that, that gets into, you know, really trippy situations of multiple levels of. Yeah, it, it, they, they do that constantly in this. And as, as a viewer, I mean, you have, I've I've seen the film so many different times that I, even I was like, oh wait a minute, oh that that was the Matrix. Oh wait, no, that was the real. Oh 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 oh, now I think I've got it. Very clever plays back and forth, you know, where you're questioning yourself, uh, which one? Because like you just said, Cipher says, I know the stake's not real. On the Nebuchadnezzar. They have a whole conversation of tasty weed. Cipher's there. Yeah. Right? So which which one is is which? And then you jump to uh, uh, immediately after that, where they're trying to figure out if Neo's the one, and they take him to the Oracle. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, right. is the Oracle with, with the room full of kids, right? The spoon, is the spoon real? Right? Bending spoons, and no, the spoon is not there. So is the Oracle scene, and that's from the Oracle, right? And she's baking cookies. I think she chain smoked, right? Right, right, right. Right. She could, so, she, could, she could tell him exactly what was going to happen, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's at that moment, if you're if they're trying to figure out if he is the one, and the Nebuchadnezzar is is fighting off the what were they called? Oh yeah, I forget the name. The uh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it, is that reality? And when when the thing's missing on his neck, well, wait a minute. If he was plugged in and that plug was there, they've removed it. How, it's 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 like this play of which reality inside of the sit simulation is the real one. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good you know? point. Yeah, and if, if Agent Smith is able to escape, right, does it mean that it was just another level in the Matrix, right? <laughs> right, because if Agent Smith is a program and he's code, um, you know, is he if he's able to go into what we would say it's a physical body, the jump, it just shows that information is cutting across levels. But to me, that suggests that the outside level is also <laughs> a kind of simulation. Otherwise, that they wouldn't have been able to do that. Right, the and, sentinels, and, the sentinels, sentinels. That's what it was. Yeah, that's right. The sentinels, and it's a there is no spoon, right? That was the line. Right? Remember, there is no spoon, right? And uh, you know, that's for those of us who've tried spoon bending, right? I don't know if people have tried spoon bending, but you know, like here's one of the spoons that I bent, right, at a spoon bending PK party in Sedona not that long ago. And so when I was talking at Google about the simulation hypothesis. You know, they're all in the AI, they're all in the computer, they're all in the computers, they're all in the science fiction. They were like, yeah, yeah, we're, we were into this. This whole thing, religion is based on information. The world is information. Yeah, all this stuff. And then at the end, I showed them a picture of, you know, that scene of the, uh, of the little kid with the spoon being bent. And I said, oh, and by the way, here's a spoon bending party where people actually did bend spoons, although it wasn't exactly the same way he did it. And then all the Google guys were like, no, that's fake. That can't be real, right? <laughs> like they were only willing to go so far uh, with the science fiction and, and with the idea of AI. But when it, it got to the actual physical rules of the world being malleable like they are in there. And that, that's where the philosophy is, is so deep and rich. You know, I mean, some people might say it's popcorn philosophy, but it's actually pretty deep the more you go into it, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I keep going back to that point. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to say this. I think that all published philosophers, that includes Plato, Socrates, all published philosophers and those that call them philosophers 
are just people working out their childhood trauma. That's it. That's it. That's it. And, 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 and putting it, putting it, putting it to paper. That's all it is. If you really read all of it, I don't care, man. Nietzsche, I don't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Go and read and just just think about it in those terms because all of us are doing the same thing. And so we are going to look at something and try to work it out. Why are we here? Where are we going? What's the meaning of life? What is it? Whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and answer that with our own life's experiences. And if we have issues with that, then we're going to go and, and try to get these answers and then go get a book on philosophy and read about somebody else's childhood trauma. You know, and, <laughs> okay. and, but why, why and, do some people get to the point where they're trying to write books on philosophy? It's almost like these questions matter more to them, right, than just say other childhood trauma or just trying to write, right? They, they make it they're almost their life's work to try to reason out these things. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying it's interesting right. for some people. Are you ready for the answer? Okay, go ahead. What's the answer? They have bills to pay. <laughs> I don't know that being a philosopher is, you know, necessarily. I, 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 hey, well, <laughs> hey, man. Hey, man. I'm just saying, taking the easy way out. Let's just write a book on philosophy. And, <laughs> I, and, and I, I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and you can, you can, Register in my course and pay me. That's what Socrates did, man. He had a school. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And, and, oh, man. How to offend everybody all at once by Jimmy Church. But everyone all at once, right? Yeah, yeah. Now we're in the multiverse. Man, man. You know, it, the thing is, um, when I was a kid, and and I I remember um, I was young, and I was young. I was I was in my I might have been twenty twenty one, and I, I can't say who. It's kind of a famous person, but but anyway, let's just say a conductor, symphony type of person had a big influence on me, and uh, and he looks across. Um, and he says to me, you read Nietzsche? Because that sounds like him. And I'm thinking, man, I got to go check this guy out. I've been hearing a little bit. And and I ended up, I was like 20, 21, and go, going to the library, right? This is 80, 84, 85. Right? And, um, and, and I started, and, and I thought at that time that these were my answers that this was going to be from some brainiac that right you know this thing and and i i digested it i did i did i got through it now i read it today and i do as comedy i don't say it does not have the same impact on me man <laughs> it does not You're not that smart of a guy you, you know what that just <laughs> what that reminds me of <laughs> is, uh, you know, uh, well, you're in L.A., so, you know, there was a, a famous book, uh, Adventures in the Screen Trade, I think it was, uh, where, you know, at the end of the book, he's talking about Hollywood and he, his conclusion is nobody knows anything. Right. <laughs> uh, like nobody really knows the answers. Right. Uh, and people think they do. But in the end, they, they don't necessarily Right. Uh, but but I think that's where, you know, our experience matters. Right. Uh, in in life. And I know uh, I was looking at the chat and people were talking about this earlier. Uh, what are ways to perceive if we're in the matrix? And they're talking about psychedelics. And I've had many people come up to me and say, yeah, you know, if you really want to see the matrix and you want to see the grid lines, you know, you should have this particular experience. Right. Um, and then there are other Indian traditions where you do yoga and you do breathing and you get into altered states or, or like, you know, the guy Neem Karoli Baba who took the LSD from Ram Das and it didn't change him at all. Right. It didn't like, it didn't affect him at all. Right. And, and it just, but, but I think that's where, you know, each of our personal experience is part of what life is about is coming up with our own philosophy, I think, you know, uh, of life and, and 
all these other guys. No, are we just all we stuff. all have, but we all have those same questions. I I, I get that. Yeah. And and when I was uh, when I was twenty twenty one, I went through some. I just just man, what's what's the meaning of everything? Is is God fake? Is God real? What's what's Catholicism? What's going on? Who who am I? What's the world about? I I, I, I traumatized myself, and I was reading way too much stuff, whether it was Nietzsche or conspiracy books on on the Vatican. Dude, my my mind was just like ripped apart, and I didn't leave my bedroom for like two weeks. I mean, my friends were sliding pizzas under the door. Right, it's like, <laughs> and it was it was like that, right? So, uh, and 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 I came out of it. But I had a friend of mine um, at that time. His name's Olivier. I saw him last year. I said, "Dude, you you don't know how bad you messed me up for about two years." Uh, <laughs> he said to me, "And I'm 20. I'm 21." He goes, "Hey, man, you know what happens when we die?" I'm like, "No, what? 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 Right?" And he's like, "Man, we just we just." Turn to dirt. What? <laughs> we achieve our place in evolution. What? What are you saying? And dude, it messed my head up. <laughs> I was going through all of this stuff. So we all have that. We're all asking those questions. You don't need the matrix to have some deep philosophical meaning. You're going to extract it out. As you're on this quest, and and that's and which which goes back to Socrates or whoever, um, when we're talking about philosophy, that those are people working out their issues. That's all. And if you find a way to relate to it, that's fine. But really, it, there it's you that wrote the book. Mm. Right? It's it's. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's why I'm wondering yeah. with the Matrix because I. I see some of the philosophical meanings in it. I do. But for me, I think it's more uh, for my access to the movie is from a technical perspective about uh, a tech, uh, you know, some technocracy and, and this, this AI agenda and where technology is going to lead us. And in the end is technology, the boss Right, whether you call it AI or we're controlled by machines that that we use for our lives that we cannot live without, right? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily dominated by, but we can't live without, and that's what I get from the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's other things like when the black cat goes by, yep. right? 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 You saw what? And you have well, the deja vu, right? <laughs> yeah, the deja vu. Yeah, right. Not see, that's a deep philosophical thing to me. And, well, and that, the, that spawned the, the whole thing of glitches in the matrix, right? That's uh, that's the, what. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and even today, I mean, I think getting back to our personal experience, there are anomalies and glitches that we see out there that we don't quite know what to make of, right? And. I, you know, that's an area where I don't know how far the Wachowskis would have really uh, thought through these glitches in the matrix, right? And how like that was going to become, like you said about red pill. I mean, that's just become like actual terminology today, right? That people sure. use for, sure. for all kinds of things, right? R- related to, you know, whether it's, I mean, I use it for synchronicity a lot. Uh, because I call that a kind of glitch. And even that goes back to Philip K. Dick, like in that speech in France, he talked about you would have the sense of reliving the same, uh, you know, the same experiences, events, saying the same things, hearing the same things. Again and again, a sense of deja vu. And, and he actually even talked about that in terms of rerunning the simulations. And, I, you know, we've talked about that before, which gets into this whole idea of the multiverse and are there multiple simulations. And one of my favorite scenes in, in one of the Matrix movies, I guess maybe it was the second one, is where, you know, Neo meets the architect and there's all the screens yeah, behind yeah. him, right? Mm-hmm. And then you see Neo saying different things and doing different things. And it's getting at this question, I think, of free will versus, do, you know, is everything faded? And I think the Matrix actually asks that as, as a big question. But you're right. I think some of these things they meant us to think about and other things 
our interpretations that we have ourselves. I mean, I'm looking at it as a computer scientist. I'm having a slightly different interpretation than somebody who's looking at it from the entertainment industry or somebody who's looking at it you know, who's deeply religious. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. they're looking at it from another angle. But I think that's what makes great art, right? Great art can be interpreted you know, in, in, in different ways. I mean, there's the old story. I don't know if this is a scene from a movie or an actual story about Kurt Vonnegut where he wrote an essay interpreting one of his works and they sent it into a, to a professor who said, this guy knows nothing about Kurt Vonnegut, right? But it was actually Vonnegut who, who wrote, the, you know, the essay. And so, you know, it gets back to, uh, you know, what each of us is, 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 is reading into it. But maybe that's the end goal of the Matrix is for each of us to define our personal philosophy. Well, just maybe they wrote a good screenplay, right? That had all of the elements. It, you know, they're looking at Act One, Act Two, Act Three. Of course, the hero's journey, which is exactly what this is, right? Right. It it is yep. it is Joseph Campbell. You know, the playbook, um, and and they just write a good screenplay and they write a good story. But how you, it, it reminds me how you, how you take it, how you see it, how you feel it, how it affects you. That's up to you, the dear reader. Um, there's a, uh, 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 a documentary. So John Lennon is at his estate, right? And in upstate New York. And he's there and somebody comes in in the documentary and goes, hey man, got a homeless guy staying out in the front yard in a tent. Ah, whatever. Let him stay there. And it's like four days later, it's cold, it's rainy, right? And Lennon, he's like, man, and Lennon's like drinking hot cocoa, right? Should we let him in? Should we let him in the house? <laughs> right? Hey, bring it, bring him in. And he sits down and goes, man, I can't, I can't believe it's you. And he goes, oh, man, it's all right. And your songs meant so much to me. And he goes, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but Lennon says something like, dude, get a grip. I didn't write that for you. I wrote that song for me. Don't no. tell Lennon. That, no, 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 no. I didn't write. That's not your song. I wrote that for me. And, and, and that's exactly it, isn't it? Some people will stop at a piece of art in a museum and start crying. And some people just walk right by it. It doesn't affect them. Well, I think that is, like I said earlier, that's what makes great art is that it speaks to each of us in our own way. But there's also a, a collective time period, right? And this is what I was trying to get at earlier where because The Matrix came out, you know, I mean, it could have come out in the 80s, right? Would it have been as, I mean, there were video games, there were computers. Would it have been nearly a successful film? if it came out then, or if it came out today, right? Where people are online all the time, or like that teenager said to Keanu Reeves, like, what's a big deal? So is that so revolutionary? <laughs> like what, what about that is so special? Yeah, he's in a game and he, and he escapes, right? That's pretty normal. Uh, but I, I think there is a collective consciousness that goes on in our societies. And depending on where we are, uh, you know, these things have a different impact on us at certain like like if you watch certain movies from the 70s you know that maybe had a huge impact at that time but you watch them today and you're like yeah okay it's just more boomer stuff or whatever <laughs> you just you might have a completely different perspective on it and and so i think that is part of the interpretation is there's a collective kind of angst or collective feeling that gets in the and then we have our personal experience and this is what you're getting at with the personal philosophers trying to figure out what the heck is really going on well, you're right, though, because Total Recall, kind of the same movie, different time period, right? And the other version of Total Recall, the one with what's his name in Burgess, what's that actor's name? I forget his name. Um, yep. And that came out in 2012. Uh, bad timing on the movie because yeah. we we got it. Total Recall, yep. you know what I mean? Same thing with The Matrix. Yeah. So if The Matrix was was a brand new movie today, yeah, does it have the same impact? 
Uh, probably not. Probably not. And even the, the Matrix Resurrections, right? The, the the fourth movie that came out in 2021 did not have nearly the impact, right? Oh, I wanted that. to like that so I wanted to like that so much. And all right, let me ask you what you thought of it. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I thought. I thought it was lazy. It was lazy. It was Matrix 1 <laughs> revamped. Mm. You know what I mean? It was it was it was a lazy it was lazy writing. It was a lazy story and it it was just put out there uh, maybe maybe a money play. But that was that was lazy to me. And I was so Dude, the moment it was available, I was right there. Yeah. I was right there. Now, nah, lazy. What did you think? Well, you know, I was looking forward to it, obviously, given, you know, my history with the Matrix and, and the simulation hypothesis. And so I was really excited to see it. And, you know, the first time I saw it, I was just scratching my head a little bit. Uh, and it, 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 took, it took a little getting used to, I'd say, right? Because it felt like, like you said, it was a, uh, it was like replaying a lot of the same beats, but in a new kind of matrix simulation, but trying to update it for today. And that's where I think the collective consciousness today and our, our familiarity with technology is so different today than it was back then that it just didn't have the same impact. That said, I think it did raise some interesting issues about AI and humans, right? I mean, if you look at the whole trilogy, I guess it's... Uh, quadrilogy you call it now <laughs> right if you looked at all four movies you notice that there's certain themes that perhaps didn't come out as much in just the first movie and well so there was no love story there was no love story and that's what the fourth movie became right, right. i think in a hold hands when they jump off the building oh that's so cute i knew they were gonna kiss you know i did no 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 that's not what the, this this was all about you know, and and the, the other thing is the uh, I'm not I'm not being a, uh, uh, overly harsh or overly critical here because the first movie and the second movie's pretty pretty dang good too as well. Yeah. All some nightmares, but the first movie had very creative writing and some very funny moments in the movie. Yeah, but I mean, seriously, good. And and then they started to get a little bit too serious and too deep, and and that's where it lost it. Because if you think about it, you remember in the first movie, this is a perfect example of like the tasty wheat. That's a great line, man. That's a funny line. And um, when um, uh, Neo's told to meet under the bridge, remember. And so he's walking up the street in the black, uh, the Lincoln, right, with the suicide doors, pulls up, doors open. They grab him off the street. He jumps in. And the blonde uh, crew member, what's her name? Switch. Switch. Yeah. She's in the back seat. And and Neo's back there. And she goes, she turns to him and he goes, man, look at that. And she goes, uh, listen, Copper Top. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right there. Yeah. That is yeah. great writing. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a, it's either our way or the highway. You know, you yeah. can get back out of it. That's great writing. Very, very funny. It, it's original and it's not lazy. Right. Yep. You know, you know, what, what do they say? You've got your whole life to make your first album. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. No, it's a good point. And I mean, this often happens with creative types, right? When they, they, they end up writing something that ends up being an unexpected success, right? And it's almost like because they don't have the time and they're just kind of winging it and they're not taking it so seriously. They're just trying to get something done. And it turns out to be th this huge success in ways that they didn't anticipate. Like you lose some of that because now there's a whole weight of expectations that's on you as a writer or as a filmmaker, right? And you have to live up to... I mean, the, the first Matrix didn't have to live up to anything, really, right? Uh, and so they could be free. Same with Star Wars and, and, and some of these other films, right? They, they could be free to experiment. Uh, but then 
by the time the, the third movie came out and, and certainly the fourth, it was like, there's this expectations of how great this is going to be. It's going to try to reproduce all these things. And they ended up trying to reproduce too much. Right. Uh, and, and I think that was part of the problem was they tried to reproduce too much of that original storyline rather than coming up with something really new. But what I was going to say is, you know, the whole, if you look at all four movies, they're really about AI as much as humans, right? Uh, I mean, in the fourth movie, you have the AI that's working with the humans. You've got this human relationship with AI. And the first scene has Trinity in it. And in the last movie, you know, it's very much showing that Trinity is also, right, kind of the one, if you will. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm, there's, a, there's mm -hmm. a whole... There's this whole other thing going on across the movies because we were so focused on the action back then. Well, and that's that, but that's that is the biggest point. The originality that the Wachowskis had in the first movie with uh, a Bullet Time and and the Kung Fu and and the exploding walls and running the the, and the angles they shot the. the all creative original ideas but as a musician as an artist as as you know somebody creative you've got to continue that flowing of the juice in your brain you've got to come up with the next bullet time idea you don't have don't go back and, okay let's do bullet time here no we've already seen that right you know when Carrie Ann Moss in the opening scene Opening scene of the movie, when she kicks the agent in the face from behind, he's standing behind her, and her leg goes straight up like this, and she right. whaps him. Remember yep. that? Yep. How yep. do you top that? How do you top that? And the first time she walked on the walls. Or yeah, was yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. same scene, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same but, scene. But, you know, it wasn't it, entirely original, because a lot of that was coming from the wire work in the Asian, you know, kind of martial arts. Right. Movie, but it was so for... The, for but they felt free to like bring it in and experiment with it in in in, in a U.S. based movie. In fact, your men are already dead. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can handle a little girl, right? <laughs> I think we can handle a little girl. Oh man, um, it, it it is just something that uh, uh, I was telling Riz earlier. I'm going to tell everybody. Um, about six weeks ago, a little over a month ago, I, it was one of those things. I just ran out of stuff to watch and I'm go back into my movie files. I'm scanning through and ah, there's the matrix. Boom. You know, I, and I watched the whole thing right beginning to end. And then before this show got booked, um, because we were going to do the show originally next week, uh, the 31st, but the 31st is Sunday. So that, messed everything up okay so anyway um uh, backing up two weeks ago three weeks ago i watched it again i did so i watched the matrix like i watched it for the first time you know just enjoying the movie that opening scene when um i'm, I'm t I, this is this is comic book writing at its best when she grabs the phone, the phone booth, yep. right? And she's running. Agent Smith puts his foot in the gas in the garbage truck. Whoa, 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 right? And he's and she's running. She runs into the thing, picks up the, and she puts her hand on the glass. Mm. Remember that? And then yep. boom. Yep. He, that is not lazy writing. Mm. That's excellent. So if you are starting off the movie like that and the movie keeps it, it keeps it going, but it's the next film. You've got to take all of that excellence and you've got to improve on it. You don't relive it. Right. So yeah, that's right. Exactly. That's how great the matrix is. Movie one. I, I agree with you. I mean, my, my ranking would be the first one is probably the best. I mean, it'd probably go one, two, three, four, to be honest with you <laughs> in terms of yeah. ranking. Film, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, three had its way of kind of closing out, you know, the war at Zion with the Sentinels and and yeah. the special effects. And uh, there was uh, the creative scene of Neo fighting the like 500 Agent Smiths. Do you right. remember that? 
Yeah, that was pretty yeah. good. That was pretty that was good. good. That was pretty what, wasn't good. that yeah. in the first movie? I'm I'm, I'm losing track of which movie. I, I, it was I, I, or, at the no, end of the just, first movie, wasn't that the end of the first movie where he was in the rain, or was it the second? Or second? I was in the, the yeah. second movie. Yeah, no, it was the second movie where he fought all the agent okay. Smiths. Okay, yeah, yeah don't no, mess sorry. with me. Don't don't mess with me. It's all <laughs> running together now. Well, so when's the when's the new book coming out? Uh, well, so uh, I'm actually working on this new book that I mentioned, God in the Simulation, but. Uh, I'm also announcing here for the first time that I'm going to be doing a second edition of the simulation hypothesis first, because it's been five years since the book came out. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the the major publishers, they haven't announced it yet, but they will the next week, uh, is going to basically be, you know, taking the second edition of the simulation hypothesis, and because it's become a bit of a classic uh, when you talk about this field. Uh, but, you know, part of my book was about how the technology is going to develop. And in five years, we've already seen it develop so much, right? I mean, AI is so much further along now than it was. And people always ask me, when, you know, when will we reach the simulation point, which is when can we create our own version of the matrix? Uh, and I call that the simulation point as a kind of technological singularity. And, you know, five years ago when the book came out, I, I thought we were looking at, you know, 50 to 100 years before we could create something like the matrix ourselves. Uh, and now, if you look at the 10 stages, we've been through so many of the stages that I think, you know, the chances that we are able to create the simulation ourselves, which, you know, if, if anyone goes back and watches our previous interviews, that means we are probably already inside somebody else's simulation. Yeah, it's yeah, just, it's like next week. It's like next week. Uh, uh, NVIDIA, you know, announcing the Blackwell chipset, right, this week. And uh, Nordic, whatever, Pharma, you know, over in yeah. Denmark is building the world's largest AI supercomputer. And they're going to have that up and running by the end of the year in 2024 using the Blackwell chipsets. Each one of those Blackwell chips, you know, are 40 grand. Yeah, and it's, 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 an, and it's an insane number of transistors. And, you know, it's like taking a huge number of GPUs and packing it into packing one. Packing it all in. And, and everybody, Meta, Amazon, right, yeah. Facebook, everybody is ordering hundreds of thousands of these chips at 40 grand a pop. Then they got a they got a version of it with two chips with an SAP uh, uh joining the two and doubling them up. Well, that's what they're building. So th there are more sup AI supercomputer uh farms being built right now all around the world. Everybody's in on it. Yeah. So uh, man, I I wouldn't be surprised if you know uh, you know, 2026, I, I don't think it's that far away. <laughs> it, it, things then, are coming quickly. And that shows yeah. GPUs. I mean, NVIDIA right, became famous for building the best GPUs, graphics processing units, for graphics for things like video games. Uh, and yet, turns out, to implement AI, you needed GPUs rather than CPUs, right? So the same chips that are being used to render graphics turn out to be the chips you need for at least the current iteration of AI. And so it's showing this kind of interesting linkage between video games, graphics, and AI. And, and that's, you know, as we talk about the matrix, right? The first time I, I thought about it, it was much more about the video game aspect, the graphics aspect. But then as you look over the whole series, you realize it's just as much about AI. So you see it's about both of those things, you know? I mean, would it hit you the same as... Would it be as shocking as it was with Neo? Would it be like that if somebody came up to me? I don't know how I would handle it. If somebody came up and said, okay, church, all right, I got something, I got something you need to look at. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. and, and, Here's a and, meta and, example of this, and you can look this up on YouTube. So in 2021, when the Matrix before the Matrix Resurrections came out. Uh, Epic and Warner Brothers released a little mini game called The Matrix Awakens, which was like this very realistic city with all these NPCs. And what somebody did recently was because the LLMs, the large language models, have gotten so good with speech uh, and conversations like ChatGPT, they hooked up the, the smart NPC engine to the NPCs in that game who are just people walking around the city. And so this guy has a video of himself walking around in the city 
while he's playing the game and telling the NPCs, hey, did you realize you're in a video game? Hey, did you realize you're in a simulation? And these NPCs react the same way that some real, quote unquote, real people are. They're like, no, of course I'm not. Or I'm too busy. I got to get to work. <laughs> I don't have time for this crap. Or, oh, tell me more. I'm intrigued. So you saw like the same reactions from actual NPCs in a game to this that you might see from, from those of us in talking about being in the simulation, you know? Yeah, man. I, I, I don't know what I, I, I don't know. Yeah. How I would? You mean this is real, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, this is, is it real? Yeah. Well, yeah. Dude, I know we're we're running we're running to the end no, here, but I want to. Yeah. Want to make ahead. sure we have, uh, you know, may, maybe uh, telling you the synchronicity story about. The oh yeah, yeah, uh, with uh, Jeffrey Kripal. Yeah, so it might be a good good place to end because it involves the matrix. So, you know, I, I've talked a lot about synchronicity and how I think synchronicity is built into the matrix itself. Uh, but this was a synchronicity that occurred that involved me and involved the matrix and involved Jeff Kripal from Rice University, who has the archives of the impossible there, and Jacques Vallée, you know, the, the famous UFO researcher who is also a computer scientist. And so, so my book came out on March 31st, 2019, on the 20th anniversary. So almost exactly five years ago. And right around that time, you know, I had shown it to Jacques before, and there was a, uh, this conference that they hold at Esalen every so often. It was kind of a UFO experiencer, researcher type event. It was in, by invite only. And so uh, they're talking about these types of things. And then Jacques Vallée is the last presenter before lunch. And so he goes to this entire presentation and his last slide, is about the simulation hypothesis. So it's about my book. So he's sitting there saying, oh yeah, Rizvert just came out with this book about the simulation hypothesis. It's about this idea that we're in the matrix. And so everybody's thinking matrix, simulation, right? Uh, and my name comes up. And then they walk out of the, the room they were in to the cafeteria. And guess who's sitting in the cafeteria at Esalen? It's Lawrence, Lawrence Fishburne. Fishburne. Morpheus no is literally sitting there. And they're all like, wait a minute. Did we just conjure this up? Did we just manifest Morpheus? <laughs> and so I've heard the story now. So Jeff Greipel tells it, but I've heard it from three or four people that were there. So you can be part of a synchronicity and not even be there. And that's, you know, he always tells the story with respect to my book. And, and, and so that's my matrix synchronicity story that I think. I said Lawrence Fishburne as a joke. I was just joking. No, he that's, was really there. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, wait a minute, isn't that Morpheus? <laughs> and they walked out and and so it was a pretty crazy, pretty crazy story. And then and then they unplugged you. <laughs> exactly, right? It was a tech maybe it was a technological synchronicity. Maybe Trinity that, that, was directing the whole thing, right? <laughs> that was the black cat. That was the black cat scene. Riz, thank you so much, my brother, and uh, just just keep doing what you're doing. I always enjoy our conversations, and I love hanging out with you. And uh, so get these books done to get you back on the show, and I'll see you next time. Would be great. Thanks so much for having me on. Always a pleasure to be on with you, brother. Yeah. Riz, you are the very best, my friend. Thank you so much. And it's Riz Verk. Uh, 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 hold on for a second. His links are below. And over on our website, uh, zenentrepreneur.com. And the links are below on our website and throughout social media. And so normally I would say at this point, this wraps our week here on Fade to Black. But tonight it does not. Because tomorrow night, right here on Fade to Black, we are having a very special Friday night show with... Jason quit. His new book is out. It is called Gates of the Anunnaki. And we're going to be going through that tomorrow night. How the book got written, why, what is it, and all of that. We've got illustrations and much more. All of that tomorrow night with Jason Quit. Fade Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, John Aside. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmasters, Drew the Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich, Intro, Space Boys, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and 
copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Jason Quit, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.